Hello, um, my name is Sean. I'm the uh, English for Academic Purposes um, coordinator here at the RCA. So I run the in-sessional and pre-sessional um, communication and academic skills courses. I'm really sorry to have missed the earlier talks, but um, I think there's some connections with what I've just heard so far. So hopefully I'll try and connect some of them. Um, I'm presenting with Julie, who I've had the pleasure of working with. So I'm really pleased that we can um, share what we've done. So um, I'm going to tell you about our pre-sessional course, so the summer course. It's, we have an eight week course and a four week course. I think that's quite common, sometimes longer. We run them in July and August. Uh, this year we had about 150 students in total, all online for the last three years. Um, and we are focusing on academic communication skills for postgraduate art and design um, students. So I'm just going to, I just threw this one in because um, it connects with what you're talking about or what um, Fian was talking about, um, a culturative change. So the students are coming in uh, in the summer and they're coming to a new educational environment. They uh, need to learn new um, communicative skills and they are communicating in a different language and a different context. So all of these together are what we look at. And my background is in linguistics and um, communication. So this is where we're coming at it from, but we um, focus here on this one. Um, the acculturative process of change is about how all of these um, elements are involved in the process of change. So students, how do they process? How do they change in the new environment? What kind of skills do they need? And how do they communicate in this when they move towards this uh, new environment. So we look here at behavioural um, changes. There are different learning strategies, different behavioural skills, and different ways of communicating within these. I am talking here about students changing, but the acculturative process of change, if you wanted to read any more about it, maybe you've heard about it, Barry uh, writes about it a lot in um, cross-cultural communication, and it's a two-way process to be ideally um, effective. So it's not just students changing, but the institution should change as well, but that's for another day. Um, so the course that we're going to talk about today um, is the summer pre-sessional, the four-week and eight-week courses. I think the timing may be going to get, yeah. So, so we've just had it accredited by our um, national organisation, Bali, the British Association of Lecturers and EAP, and um, particularly the change um, that led to us being accredited was uh, a process-led course. So when we are talking about the communicative um, skills that students need, well, I'm not looking at uh, how do you communicate in a presentation? How do you communicate through a piece of writing? Those are the outcomes. We're looking at the, the processes. How, what do students need to do in communicating in order to reach um, in order to be able to give a presentation or enable to, in order to be able to talk about um, a research project, what steps do they need to go through? That's what students have found very difficult. Um, so it's the process that we're looking at rather than the outcome. So what do they need to go through? In uh, art and design education, they need to be able to use skills of dialogic, um, dialogic skills of communication. So they need to have lots of dialogue with their tutors, with in group work, in with their peers. So it's all about the communication and the conversations that they have. It's also about collaborative work, especially now we've just moved to short courses. There's an awful lot of um, collaborative projects. So it's about the dialogue within the collaboration and the outcomes of those projects. It's about reflective learning. So they need to reflect on their learning. It's not just reading, re um, reviewing their reading, thinking about it, but it's also reflecting on their conversations so they might or their observations so they might go out and observe continually inquiring observe read have conversations but they need to reflect on this they need to think how do I respond to what I've seen how do I respond to what I've read and how do I respond to the conversations that I've heard in the group or with my peers so it's not enough just to have the conversations they need to do continually processing um, these um, forms of inquiry I forgot the next one. Okay, they have um, yeah. Their learning is very um, experimental, so they're expected to um, push the boundaries. They're expected to try 
have conversations about what went what in their reflective conversations what worked what didn't work why it's all about the dialogue and the pushing yourself forward to ex experiment more so i think the next was experimentation and experience okay so experimentation through reflective discussions and finally experiential learning so it's not just about reading and writing but it's about they're making practice they're taking themselves through the process it's about their conversation so it's all of these things that we try that we needed to think about in communicating and in moving to an online environment so these are the communicative acts that we needed to transfer into an online environment and then i was fortunate to meet up with julie and we moved to the online environment so here we are. <laughs> so um, as part of a conversation that I'd started with Sean back in 2019, um, when I first joined the RCA, was about how we were using um, RVLE and our tools to kind of um, expand on how EAP delivered their offer in the summer. So we started having a conversation about how we could use blended options for the, that summer activity. Um, and then obviously March 2020 happened and instead of it being nice and blended and kind of a nice lead into to those kinds of tools, it was okay, everything is moving online, we have to create a contingency for that. So we obviously moved online um, and there were moments of hilarity, I'm sure, uh, between staff, but providing them with, with the tools and the training so that we could move online and that experience would be reasonable for the students that were taking part. So since then, um, we've learned from all of the things that happened during that initial stage um, and kind of developed those into using tools more effectively, um, getting feedback from students, quite significant amounts of feedback from students and from the staff using those tools to deliver the same kind of offer. So every year we have kind of changed what that really looks like. Um, this is our four-week version of um, pre-session. Um, and what we actually had a look at was what tools that we could have a, you know, kind of use that would be useful for students and focus on kind of those principles um, and values that, that Sean was just talking about. So how do we create that conversation? How do we create a, a collaborative environment for students to actually engage where they can't normally? Whereas where EAP was always um, in person, you had quite a lot of in-person conversation um, and activities going on. So how can we not exactly replicate that, but how can we, um, you know, facilitate that kind of level of engagement? And so what we ended up doing was using Zoom, Padlet and Talis um, in different ways to try and create that kind of conversation. So students were using Padlet within Zoom sessions so that they could kind of underpin what they were talking about and the readings they were doing and the activities they were taking part in, but also kind of trying to do that as well asynchronously outside of that. So using Talis was something that we decided to try and use. I think it was um, Hypothesis before the first time that we did it during um, 2020, but we found Talis was far more flexible um, and staff have really taken that on board using it for the summer, the summer course so that worked out really, really well. And a lot of the feedback we got from students was that, you know, having that ability to flip between using Padlet in person, but also asynchronously, but also facilitate that intelligence to work really well for them. Um, so here's some of the work that um, the students and the staff kind of all did uh, together, kind of building everything. Um, and how students um, had a look at, I think they created like ongoing blogs so that they're able to kind of communicate together, but also provide information to their tutor. So where we can't do those things in person, we could do them online in an engaging way. So staff were able to create content that they gave to their students and focus on areas that, um, that they wanted to look at. This is their reflective blog. So they had to write, every week they had to write something in their reflective blog and they had to, it could be anything. It could be as um, as time goes on, the knowledge that we learn is more and more difficult. My heart, in my heart, I know they are connected, but my my mind is messy sometimes. It could be anything they wanted, and it could be just about what they've been looking at, or it could be about their learning. And and we encourage them to be more reflective, deeper in their reflection about their learning later on. But we use we ask them to write this just a little bit every week, and then they took this, they brought this to their Zoom one-to-one -one tutorial, which was very short, 
Um, and then the tutors had a discussion about this. So when it became more about their learning, they could have the conversation about their learning. But the tutor, it was only shared between one student and their tutor. So the tutors' feedback on this was fantastic because they said that they learned more about the students here than they'd ever done in face-to-face -face tutorials. So this, and the students had time to think about what they were writing and to write it very personally in the privacy of their own home, but knowing that they were going to share it. So they could edit it if they wanted to beforehand, but it was really, really insightful for the tutors to, to think about their learning and their, their progress. So just to finish off, yeah, this is very dry, but it's just um, to think about what we um, were trying to do and what I think the benefits were, because so, I think there were many, many benefits to having it online. Um, we, we could focus on the process. We itemized the process so that we looked more carefully at it. Maybe that was a planning issue, but, but it made us stage our um, activities more carefully. It made us be explicit about the learning outcomes and what they were trying to achieve. So the, the asynchronous and synchronous learning was really helpful here because we wanted the students to have cognitive processing time so that they could they could think about what they wanted to say. They could think about their reflections to something, even a, an image. They could think more carefully so they could prepare beforehand. They could share with each other in a different kind of space. So not just communicating verbally. So the communication was very diverse. It didn't have to be spontaneous conversation. It didn't have to be a conversation. It could be written communication. So it's about getting the same message and the same community interaction across, but in many different ways. So I think it was definitely beneficial and some of the students did too. So uh, these are some of our feedback comments. It was clear and explicit, um, open, dynamic, friendly, um, variety of formats and methods. They, many people commented on the variety of formats. They liked the Padlet and the Tal and Talis and, um, being able to share and go between these. Um, planning explicit tools and stages, good. Moodle, Padlet and Telus were useful for sharing studying materials easily. So that was about outside of the online, outside of the Zoom session, they, could, they had a record. They could keep their record, keep their, their fellow students' records as well. Um, I loved the way everything was structured, visual, interactive, bits and pieces, not huge chunks. So we, we took this away as well. We've now gone on to do much more manageable pieces of learning. So we've taken a lot of this away. Variety of formats, tools, et cetera, physic, physical record of sessions. Again, they like to have the different um, evidence and re um, recording of sessions, not, not recording, but just notes on the on the Padlet. Telus and Padlet are great to communicate and share ideas. So again, the communication that wasn't verbal and it wasn't spontaneous, uh, totally approachable. <laughs> it could be reacted to different media used multi-form. My mind works like that. So that was Padlet a lot to do. And Talis moving around between the text. So there we go. Um, I'm really happy and we're, we're going to definitely keep um, elements of, the, of that as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions before we wrap up for the day? Anything comes through online? I was really struck by using Padlet as a blogging tool, which I wouldn't have necessarily occurred to me. I, I, I love it because the, you know, the posts were quite sort of short, but I guess that was what was um, what was wanted. And so, uh, it's um, it's nice to get the students reacted so well to that as a as a platform. Um, what made you think of doing the blogging on Padlet? Or was it just because they need to be reflective, and many of them had not had much, any practice with being reflective, and especially about their learning. So um, we wanted them to prepare for the tutorial much better, so that they had already thought about it. So, do you mean why do we YouTube? Yeah, I just was just wondering whether that you looked at other platforms, but you thought that was the best one. I think one of the things that we did part of Padlet was. It wasn't part of emergency teaching, but it was something that we'd already been using kind of underline. But 
I think that what we've done is whenever we provide any kind of tool like this, we try and look at different ways that you can use it for, to fill different holes. And so I think that's where that's, that's come from. It means that students are interacting on that within class and it becomes something they're quite familiar with. And so interacting, they don't have to learn another system. We don't, we're not using a Moodle um, you know, blog instead, which is far more cumbersome and not as modern looking, I suppose. So I think it's one of those things. It's, it's just, I think, feel, but also because it just means that it's easy for them to consume and, and mm. use. Yeah, I think yeah. I have colleagues who use it now. We use it a lot, even though we're um, in person now. So we ask them, students now need to have a lot more practice about communicating verbally. So we ask them to record. You can record a little bit on it, either with a video or not. And so we ask them to put that to talk every day, just to themselves, if necessary. <laughs> So that they put it on the padlet and they re and I, I I think they're fantastically flexible. You can have the background, you can talk about the background, and you can put images and and they like the ability to spread out and be and use it as they want. I think, but also multimedia. Do you have an institutional subscription to it? Yeah. yeah. We've got, we have we've got backpack or what used to be backpack, but now it's not. It's per user, but. Exactly. Is there any assessment? Or is it, uh, there is, but it, they don't have to have it. But um, the assessment is, I can't know. Um, they have to do a piece of um, reflective um, writing and um, and a presentation. So and they can use all of the tools to, to do that. So the weekly reflection that was just up to them to do that. Like well, they no, they had to do that. They had to, yeah. Um, I think it was 400 words a, a week, yeah. 